This is the Earth Science Classroom. Welcome back to the channel. This video is on the Bones Reaction Series. It's part of the Igneous Rocks playlist. And in this video, we're going to look at what the Reaction Series is, who Bone was, what he found in his cooling magma experiment, and the implications to this amazing series of reactions that creates these amazing minerals and therefore Igneous Rocks. The Bowens Reaction Series is a amazing experiment that was conducted in 1922 by Norman L. Bowen, a Canadian born in Ontario but worked in the United States for various universities and by 1912 had moved down to DC to the National Laboratory. And there he started working on these experiments, working with basaltic magma in a ready-made or built kiln just for his investigation and he started to work with this magma as it was cooling down at a certain pressure but allowing the temperature to decrease and investigate and observe what was going on in the magma when these minerals were crystallizing and forming and nucleating in the magma at a range of temperatures from the hottest to the coldest and what he found from a series of awesome experiments that were repeatable was that the magma was producing a certain mineral at a certain temperature and certain minerals based on different characteristics so he could find and categorize these different reactions according to a set order and by what elements were in the minerals as they were consolidating and crystallizing so what he found by 1922 was that these ordered mineral crystallizations that were, that were occurring in the magma were being repeated and they were being consistent. So he formulated this reaction series that we use today as a foundation for both igneous petrology and igneous rocks and also common minerals and how these crystallize into igneous rocks both plutonic under the ground and also volcanic on the surface. So the two main reactions that were occurring in the magma that he observed was the discontinuous and the continuous reaction series. Now both have their own distinct characteristics and elements and will be discussed in this video. Now before discussing the actual reaction series we are going to do a chemistry review of magma and magmatic material because magma is that molten liquid or semi-solid material that is created from the melting of pre-existing country rock either in the crust or the sphere or in the asinosphere the upper mantle and this pre-existing rock uh igneous or metamorphic or maybe sedimentary in rare cases but mostly igneous and uh, metamorphic then we melted and it's going to contain certain mixtures of elements and atoms that are consistent and common up in the upper mantle and the crust these eight minerals are going to be things like silicon and oxygen and iron and magnesium potassium calcium so these all range in percent weight of the upper mantle, obviously oxygen and silicon being the most common. So what we get is a crust and lithosphere and a xenosphere that has a high percentage of oxygen and silicon combining and bonding because oxygen is that uh, anion which is very sticky and will connect with a lot of cations and form that lovely compound. So you get a lot of silica, a lot of silica in the crust and all of this magma, the basaltic magma that Bowen worked on was a silicate rich magma. So a lot of these minerals that he was observing were all silicate minerals forming these igneous rocks both in mafic and felsic compositions. So the atoms and elements and the chemistry that goes into the magma is very important to discuss because Bowen is looking at both directly and indirectly as he's observing these minerals forming without the elements and atoms arranging in certain bonds and frameworks and lattices and how they bond both with covalent, ionic and even metallic bonds, you don't get those minerals and therefore you don't get the arrangement and organization 
of these different igneous rocks that we find on the surface and in the crust. So the chemistry is very important to work with. And again, all this was done in his basaltic magma in the kiln, as he called it. And the magma and the chemistry is built around the silica tetrahedra, that pyramid shape with the small silicon atom in the center with the four oxygens on the outside. And that gives it that nice anion chemistry. And it can bind and bond very well and easily. And the sites can work with all these different cations like calcium, sodium, potassium, iron, aluminum, and magnesium. Now, in terms of the chemistry and a bit of higher level chemistry, you can also discuss the effect or the characteristics of magma being either super saturated, saturated, or dissolution. So the level of how much stuff is in the magma can dictate how fast these minerals can both nucleate, which means coalesce and join and start to form these solid materials within the, the magma melt, the liquid base, and how these elements are drawn out and bonded with covalent or ionic bonding, how they form and how they're taking out different elements at different times based on the temperature and pressure to form these minerals and how the magma is then left with different compositions of these elements in order to make the next minerals in the order based on the temperature. So which is what, what Bowen basically observed was that organization of both the chemical bonding of the atoms and elements with a certain temperature and how the magma would change composition on its elements based on what was being made and crystallized at that point in time. Now we're going to start here with one of the branches of the Y, the Y branch, what they call it as a generic term. Now this is the discontinuous branch. That means that these minerals are forming and then there's a completely different mineral based on the chemical composition is forming afterwards. Now what happens is you have this backdrop, this this base of this really high silica composition magma and these different elements and therefore minerals being formed are taking out different elements but the undertone, the, the base is that silicon dioxide and how the silica is increasing in the amount of chains uh, connected so as you're going from olivine being the hottest temperature down to biotite at the coldest around 800 degrees celsius biotite has a lot larger silica framework due to what's called polarization now the olivine is the most simple just one single uh, nesosilicate framework of one single silica tetrahedra with that magnesium and iron. Then you get the pyroxene, which is mixed with the magma, and more silica gets mixed in to the formula. And as you can see, you go from SiO4 down to Si2O6, and you keep going more and more silica, but you can add in different amounts of magnesium, iron, and then, and then with biotite, you're going to add in some potassium and aluminum into the chemical formula. So you're increasing the size of the mineral composition, the chemical composition. And what happens is each time olivine changes to peroxine, then peroxine goes to amphibole, amphibole to biotite, the mineral, it forms. Like amphibole is going to form, and then it's going to be mixed in and react with the magma with the silica rich magma to form a new mineral which is biotite at the end of this series so this is why it's called a discontinuous series because you've got these different minerals for different temperatures and they form and then get remixed into the magma and reorganized as it cools down more and more nucleation and crystallization occurs to form a larger mineral to add on to it, then they call it a different mineral like peroxine. So this is the other side of that Y branch I discussed earlier with the discontinuous branch. This is called the continuous branch, basically meaning that rather than having dis distinct or discrete minerals forming and then a new one forming, you have one type of mineral, which in this case is called plagioclase or plagioclase feldspar. 
Now, feldspar is a German word that means ground minerals. It's very common minerals. And what Bowen saw was that this one mineral group, plagioclase, was being formed at the same kind of temperatures as those of the discontinuous branch, like from olivine down to biotite. And what was happening was you had this range of temperatures from 1500 degrees, really hot magma, down to 1100 degrees Celsius. And you had these two end member feldspars being formed. Now, with the same kind of base of silica tetrahedra and sheets of silica that you saw with the discontinuous branch, with olivine and pyroxene, but you have the addition of aluminum and either calcium or sodium. Now, in this side of the branch, there was very little, if not none, of the magnesium and iron. Now, that is probably down to chemical reactions, both ionic bonding and the ionic structure of magnesium and iron with the, the 2 plus magnesium or 2 plus iron versus the calcium and sodium and how these sites are bonded at certain temperatures and which sites are available and how the silica is shaped in terms of the the lattice framework in order to take either a calcium or sodium or a magnesium or iron so this is looking at a range of or a ratio of either calcium or sodium between these temperatures. Now, what Bowen observed was uh, analyte that was that pure calcium plagioclase feldspar. And then on the other end of the scale was albite or albite that was purely sodium. Now, in between, you do get a range of either analyte or albite, so the calcium or sodium. And as it comes down from the analyte to the albite, you get this gradual decrease in calcium but an increase in sodium until you get down to the lower temperatures and all by it forms so that is based on the availability of calcium because most of the calcium gets picked up in a, a hotter environment hotter magma and also with a high mafic uh, environment and magma with iron and magnesium you also get a how a high calcic uh, magma as well with high calcium so the Y reaction series kind of looks like this, where you have the discontinuous branch on the left, on the right is the continuous, and it works in the same temperature range as each other, but then they come down to this white line that I've drawn in there as a kind of a, a meeting point of the two branches, and then they go down into a lower temperature. Then you get this combined or mixed magma whereby a lot of the magnesium and ion has been taken out by the discontinuous minerals, the olivine and pyroxene, and also the calcium and sodium have also been uh, used in the different types of plagioclase feldspars. But you do have the addition now of the potassium feldspars, the alkali feldspars, and a certain kind of uh, microgroup, which is muscovite, which is more white. And finally, the end, we have this amazing and beautiful quartz forming, which is just purely the leftover silica dioxide, SiO2 and SiO4, that's left over in the magma in this, this composition. So in more detail, the potassium feldspar or K-spar, looking at, again, the Si308 with the potassium and aluminum, and muscovite is, again, uh, similar to the potassium feldspar in the way that it's chemically formed, but you have this combined branch of colder temperature magmas that's below 800 degrees, and the potassium feldspar, maybe some sodium feldspar are forming at this point, and then it gets colder into the muscovite, and then finally the coldest temperature, basically around 600 degrees, or maybe even colder sometimes, you get the formation of quartz, and quartz is the last one to form. Now these, uh, Muscovite and quartz, especially quartz, has a nice three-dimensional lattice framework. So in terms of the energy or physics in this crystallography and, and how the bonds form, quartz requires a lot of energy, a lot more bonds, covalent bonds, and it's a 3D structure. So it's very different in terms of the hardness of the mineral 
that's formed. Uh, it's very stable. When you get up into the higher temperatures that form olivine and uh, anthrite on the continuous side, those are more unstable and they have more disorder compared to the colder, longer time to organize, very ordered, very strong, structured and high energy quartz. So in combination, you have on the left discontinuous, on the right the continuous, and below the bottom of the cold temperatures, you have this combined uh, reaction series of the cold temperatures with the higher energy. So temperatures are on the left from you know 1400, but we know that anthrite is a little bit hotter with uh, 1500 degrees Celsius. But on the right, we have the igneous rocks that are going to uh, form as a process of these minerals consolidating and joining up to form these solid rocks from the melt and the olivine, maybe some pyroxene, and going to form into ultramafic igneous rocks. And the mafic and intermediate basaltic and andesitic magmas, they're going to be a lot of the uh, amphiboles and biotites. And then the felsics are going to be in the muscovites, the uh, potassium feldspar, the quartz. So you get the different rocks like granite, for example, that has a combination of some of the quartz, has some felt spars, maybe the sodium felt spars, definitely the uh, muscovites and the micas and the biotites. That combination goes into granite or the high silica. Then you've got more of the mafic rocks, uh, more of the pyrotite, um, and more of the magnesium and iron concentrated rocks. They're going to be filled with the proxene and olivines more than the quartz. So the Bones reaction series is this Y-shaped reaction series looking at basaltic magma and how it cools. And when it cools down, you have this formation of different minerals, different temperatures. So there's two branches and the hotter range of the magma, there's the discontinuous and continuous. On the left, we have this olivine, which is the basic uh, mineral that's first formed from the cooling magma at 1400 degrees. Then it gets melted back into the magma and added to with the silica, which is, forms pyroxene, and that in turn melts and links and connects with more uh, silica in the magma to form amphibole and finally biotite at the cold temperatures. As you can see, the silica tetrahedra becomes more and more advanced through polarization and the addition of the magnesium or iron in this discontinuous range. On the other side, with the same kind of temperatures, you get the feldspar, the plagioclase feldspar, forming from anthrite at the hottest, which is purely calcium with the silica and aluminum, then down colder temperatures of albite, which is going to be a more sodium uh, percentage, and this happens around 1150 degrees Celsius. Then both branches combine in the magma to form three separate minerals, the potassium or alkali feldspar, which is similar to the pot potassium feldspar, a bit colder formation, more bonds, larger silica. And then you get muscovite, which is the mica group, which is more white, different from the black biotite at the cold temperatures with more p uh, potassium included. Quartz, which is our final mineral to form in the colder temperatures, which is purely the silica dioxide, which is left over from all of the different minerals, taking out the elements from the magma. So you're left with quartz with the three dimensional framework, very hard and high energy required to form this mineral with a very high melting point. As you can see, the temperature ranges from the high to low from 1500 down to around 650 degrees. And that's what Bowen found in 1922 was these different minerals, these common minerals that were rock forming minerals and how they form different temperatures within the magma. Mm -hmm.